All right. So today we need to talk about chapter nine, implementation and evaluation of an IMC program. So ad appeals are the approach that's used to attract attention and influence the feelings of the customer towards the product or brand. And there are basically two broad categories that your text talks about, informational, rational, and then emotional. The informational rational are based on utilitarianism. And so it's, uh, it's just a motivation through utilitarian principle. Those can be kind of boring. So emotional is a lot of times used in books. There's always, uh, or oftentimes there are there are combinations of the two. So, and categories. When we talk about these sort of categories, it's always important to recognize that they can overlap. That you can have more than one, and that you can have overlapping categories. So when you classify ads, when we look at them, and we do things like content analysis on them, we can classify them in a number of different ways. And oftentimes those categories overlap. Just like in building your brand and branding, um, you can find combinations of categories of brands. Brand scholars generally say there are things like uh, descriptive brands, geographic location brands, alphanumeric brands, name-based brands, things like that. And you can have combinations of those. So the focus is on, oh, I got a typo there. The, uh, the Third mistake I've made in my life, and write this video on history as well. We focus on the dominant trait of the product. And informational are often used with high involvement products, for example, cars. And so they give you a lot of, if you look at the ads for cars, a lot of times it's about the features and details of the car. If you think about the Subaru ad commercials. What are they providing you with in a lot of those? How many of you remember the Subaru ad commercials that are dealing with the safety? Isn't it where um, they're, they're, they're joining someone and they're they, um, they do a They do a series, and let's see if we can pull it up quickly. They, call it red. they lived. Yeah, but they're like, they shouldn't have made it, but they're driving a Subaru, so they did make it. <coughs> So that ad is obviously informational. What is Subaru trying to sell? And is Subaru basically the safest car on the road? It's one of them, but is it the safest? And where did Volvo get most of their safest? They actually, Volvo actually used Mercedes, Mercedes Benz technology in a lot of their safety. So Mercedes didn't want to focus on Volvo, focused on the idea of safety. Now Subaru is focusing on the idea of that's an informational ad, obviously, that's detailing the reason that you should buy a Subaru because you've got a family and you're concerned about the family. The implication is obviously that it's a safe car. And they obviously believe that that's a competitive advantage for them. What does Mercedes Benz want it to be their competitive advantage? in the United States market. It's not so much in Europe, by the way. Mercedes-Benz are used as taxi cabs. In most so luxury cars. here? Luxury yeah, it's a luxury car, even okay. though they're not necessarily you know, as luxurious as American luxury cars in many respects in terms of the features and stuff like that that they have. They're 
their image in the United States and their advertising tends to focus not on the fact that they're a safe car, and they really are. They're well engineered and they're very safe, but their competitive advantage is that it's a quality luxury car that will last a long time. Forever and ever and ever, Mercedes didn't really change their body style very much, unlike American car manufacturers. You couldn't tell in the 1980s, one year from another, unless you were really a car enthusiast, because they all sort of looked the same, which, which sort of led to this sort of classic style. So the competitive advantage could be a direct or indirect comparison to other brands. And in, in those types of uh, indirect ads, and I would say the Subaru ad is kind of an indirect, focusing on the competitive advantage of their car. The implication is being that what? Other cars are maybe not as safe. Um, informational ads can also focus on a favorable price appeal by highlighting things like special offers or everyday low prices. And those kinds of informational appeals are often used in economic downturns. News appeals. When they launch a new product or if they have significant modifications, you'll often have an informational ad that details the modifications and maybe part of their total IMC program involves a rollout. So Apple, for example, does press releases when they're going to release, and they do it about every two years. They release new iPhone models. They have a press release. They also have a press conference, and then they'll release their advertising campaign. And so it's an integrated approach to all of those to let you know that there's the new, newest, latest, and greatest and, uh, in the iPhone. Popularity appeals are also a type of informational appeal. Now, the interesting thing with popularity appeals is what? Is there a difference between companies use them and they are informational? You know, the number one trusted brand in America, the number one selling truck in America, that's Ford's popularity appeal. What could be wrong with a popularity appeal? It is informational, but it's at high level rationale information. It's not. One of the logical fallacies is actually an appeal. It's called um, ad populum, and it's a, an appeal to the populace. Is there a difference between most preferred and preferred by most? There can be. They can overlap. You could have something that's most preferred and also preferred by a majority of the people. We tend to think of in the United States, for example, the idea of democracy as being the most preferred political system on the planet because it's the one that recognizes individual freedom and the right to participate in self-governance and all of those kinds of lofty ideals that we associate with, with our system of government. And it's also probably the most popular, although when you start actually asking people about how they feel about certain things, they tend to be less um, democratic than we might hope. So there could be a difference between most preferred and preferred by most. Just a pure popularity contest, maybe not the, the best way of choosing. For example, if you're trying to buy a car and you hear that Ford is the number one selling truck in America, well, how are you going to use it? What, what kinds of features do you actually need? If you get into most Ford F-150s today, particularly the Super Cruise, they're really more like, and the reason people started buying them in place of cars, they're more like a car than they were, say, 15 or 20 years ago when they were a pretty utilitarian vehicle. Emotional appeals. A lot of marketers view informational, pure informational appeals as being dull, and they often are. They're often very dull, although I would say the um, they lived commercial is informational, but it's not necessarily dull. So you can use emotion to evoke psychological and social needs. So if you think about this in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So you start off at the base with physiological needs, food, water, shelter. Then you have safety needs on top of that. And then the next level in the pyramid is esteem needs. And so a lot of these are appeals to the psychological or social, but they can also be appeals to safety needs.
So in, in emotional and emotional overlapping. Values. Yeah, you can have, I mean, and I think the Subaru ad is an example of one where you have an overlapping category. It's obviously very emotional. You're dealing with life and death and accident safety, and so it's obviously a, it's obviously kind of a combination of both. Studies show that ads that are purely emotional are two times more likely to generate large profit gains for a company than ads that are informational. And emotional ads can reduce price sensitivity, particularly when you're dealing with luxury goods. Why would that be? Consumers, yeah, consumers overwhelmingly say that they equate price with what? Quality. It is a heuristic that's used to indicate quality. We have a tendency to think that Nike shoes are better than, <coughs> better quality than the shoes that you buy at Walmart that are you know, not a Nike brand. Um, in reality, where are they, where are they both made? They're both made in the same factories you know, with a very similar design and same manufacturing processes, but consumers do use uh, price as a heuristic for quality. Transformational ads are ones that make using the product warmer, more exciting, more appealing. And they're ones that connect so highly in the minds of the consumer that you can't use the brand or buy the brand or recall it without being reminded of the experience generated by the app. And BC Clark. BC Clark, I think, yeah, the, everybody remembers the jingle with BC Clark. I think the core bit's like dirty now to clean it up. Uh -huh. okay. I think the old Coca-Cola ads um, in my generation, you really remembered these, particularly at the holiday, and they were transformational. So here, this is a really old ad. I like you have to. I have to watch an ad for an ad. Since I teach ethics, I won't skip past the ad because that would be unethical. That would be called being a free writer. And I've seen like a the of that. They had uh, they had a Christmas version of that ad as well, where they were all holding candles on, in the shape of a Christmas tree, and it was I think it was a powerfully emotional appeal. I, I'd like to uh, the time when, uh, particularly when I was growing up, you were dealing with things like the Cold War, and there was this idea that we really needed to focus on bringing people together. So they can connect so tightly with the brand with consumers. And what is Coke doing to keep that sort of theme alive? You see it in their integrated marketing campaigns today. What is Coke doing that's still sort of that idea of connecting 
and bringing people together and sharing the experience and living the, the Coke brand. The names, yeah, share a Coke with the idea that they're they're putting the names on the bottles. How many of you have gotten seen their name? I haven't actually seen a grant yet. But those those are sort of transformational IMC appeals. <clears throat> So a lot of them combined, obviously, products uh, that are made on a purely emotional or purely rational basis are few and far between. And so a lot of these companies combined the rational and emotional. And I think the CTCA ad, as much as I think that CTCA is overwhelmingly unethical in their advertising, I think they do a good job of combining. It's hard to believe it's been eight years since I made that commercial. And now I'm a 10 year survivor. Today's a special day, big box come to me. I'm on here, ride my horse, appreciating everything. I let change the day I was diagnosed with cancer. It was hard when I was lying in the hospital and didn't know if anybody survived me with cancer. But I decided if I survive this, I want to offer hope to somebody else and to show them that there are people out there in cancer treatment centers of America who can make a difference. To find out more about cancer treatment centers of America and our unique treatment options for complex late stage cancer, go to cancercenter.com. You'll be able to see our treatment results for many types of cancers and how they compare to national averages. You can also check and participate in insurance plans. The doctors look over what So what are the, how many rational appeals do you see in that app? What are some of the ones that you can recall that are rational? They said something about innovative, like technologies that we may not know exist, but there wasn't really anything to back it up. So okay. Like, what else? So that's one rational appeal, that we have innovative technologies, and then they, along with that, they're showing things like what? Yeah, but the MRI machines and the scans that they have that are, you know, cutting edge according to them. What else was informational about the ad? What else did they tell you? You can go to their website and you can find what? All their locations. All their locations. And what else could you find? What's the big one for somebody who's fighting cancer? they might want to know about that was really informational. Let's go back to the app. You'll be able to see our treatment results for many types of cancers they compare to national averages. You can also check for participating insurance plans. The so there's two right there, two informational appeals that they use right there. But they then combine it with a really powerful image afterwards. So you can go to the website, you can find their treatment options and how their options compare with national averages. 
And then we flip back to the emotions. Like the decision was always wrong. I can't just read such as America, every resource, every one of us, everything we do every day is focused on you, our patient, your treatment, your healing, your survival. That for Dan now, I just appreciate life so much more. I appreciate the little things, being able to carry a bucket of water from our horse again after like running a marathon. Now, so this is one that uses popular fear and hope. If you instill fear, you have to generally provide hope. Now, the problem with combining these from an ethical standpoint, one of the things that I think we should always think about, of course, this is because my dissertation topic focused on ethics, and so I like it, is when you do that, are you overriding the rational with the emotional? And what constitutes a rational decision making. We talked about this before. What, what are the three characteristics that constitute a totally rational decision? And I would suggest to you that if you have cancer, I mean, one of the reasons I think CTCA, I think their ads are brilliant. I think they do a good job. But I would submit to you that their, their marketing is maybe unethical because it relies on both as a combination of an appeal between rational actor and emotional. I mean, cancer, just the word cancer, is an enormously scary thing for most people. When you hear that, you think that, you know, die, you're gonna think death. And so they provide hope. You know, we, we have cutting edge technology. But what makes it a rational choice that you may wanna think about in terms, of what are the three things that you wanna do? And if you were completely to be, and this is one of the problems with having completely rational ads is that they, I don't think, I, I don't know that it's completely capable of having a, a totally rational ad. If you think about the Subaru commercial, they're focusing on their safety features and the fact that people live, but that is also inherently, car crashes are scary. How many of you have ever been in a car accident? I've been in one where the vehicle turned over several times. It's a frightening experience. And you want to know that you're going to walk away from it, and Super is doing a pretty good job of telling you that. And they're providing, you know, like fear of car crashes and then hope. Particularly when you become, for those of you who are not yet, when you become, I, I only know this from listening to my brother and other people who have children, because I don't have children. I never wanted them, don't like them. But uh, I'm told that, you know, parents have this overwhelming fear when their kids go out and start driving. Because... We know that particularly boys drive too fast. And so you might want to consider the safety factors of a car, but that's an emotional decision that's predicated. And the motivation may be based on a fear that you have that your child is not going to be safe, or that your family's not going to be safe in the car, and you want that comfort. So what constitutes a really rational decision making? Well, there are three critical elements to it. And if you're overbearing any of those elements, then it may be a really emotional decision that appears to be a rational decision. One criteria is that the decision is knowing. Now, that's a fairly low bar, that you are conscious and uh, aware of what's going on. With high-end high -end products, particularly like cars, that's obviously, you know, you don't just wake up suddenly in, in the car dealership's office. However, when we think about impulse purchases, do you really think about it? And are you knowing? That the decision is the product, and the last two prongs are more difficult. That the decision, in terms of a rational basis for the appeal, is the product of a voluntary choice between rational alternatives. Now this seems to be an easy bar to overcome, but it may not be. Because the critical test with regard to whether or not the choice is voluntary is, is the will overborne? And you can, you can appear to be making rational choices, but the will may be over, overborne. Textbooks suggest that with regard to autonomy, 
that autonomy is not something that you have one moment and not the next. That you you don't that you you can be autonomous one second and not the next. Um, I really disagree with that proposition in, in a lot of textbooks and a lot of uh, people that talk about marketing ethics in this field because I think you can have autonomy in one situation and maybe not in the next. I think that I'm a fairly rational, comprehensive person when it comes to doing things like selecting the textbooks that I'm going to use in my classes. What do I use as criteria? Well, that it covers the material uh, enough that I think students get what they need to know from it. Obviously, a lot of the ancillaries that the, the publishers provide are important to me. And I could make perfectly rational decisions about that all day long, but if this morning I was the doctor and I got a diagnosis that I had pancreatic cancer, with regard to that decision, I may not be really voluntary. I see the CTCA ad, probably I'm going to be pretty rational about this because I've spent so much time in my ethics course and in this class really slamming. I think CTCA does a wonderful job in their, their marketing communication. I don't know that they're ethical because I think as much informational appeal as they provide, if you hear the word cancer, you may not be able to, you may not be the best person to evaluate whether or not that product is good. And so one of the things that, that you know, I ask students is how would you evaluate these appeals? Well, I have a cousin who, his specialty, he's a full professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and his specialty, he is a, he's a, what we call a mud pud, I'm a Judd Fudd, which is a JD PhD, a Mud Fudd is an MD PhD. And so a lot of times students will say, well, you evaluate a doctor based on success rates. My cousin's specialty is in pancreatic cancer. And as much as Peggy tells you that she's a 10 year survivor, there are basically two types of pancreatic cancer. Most common is the fast sort of, you're, you're, you get it and you're dead pretty quickly, there is a kind that can go into remission, but you are going to die from this. And he really believed when he started working on this, that he would be the one to, or he and his team would be the ones that would solve basically, or find a cure for pancreatic cancer. And they haven't yet. I mean, it's a very aggressive and fatal cancer. And so, you know, how are you going to evaluate that if you're not a mud fud? Well, you look at things like survival rates and you might say to somebody, wow, my, my cousin's name is James White, by the way. You might say that James White is a horrible, to all of his patients die. But if you're working with really the most difficult cases, you know, I mean, if you're an oncologist, who treats nothing, your specialty, let's say you decide you're going to go into oncology and you're going to treat nothing but skin cancer, you're probably going to have a pretty good success rate. Most skin cancers, you're not going to die from. The exception to that is melanoma, which can go into the lymphatic system. But you may have a wonderful success rate. If you're working with patients that all you're doing is studying pancreatic cancer patients, you may have a horrible success rate. And so my point is, is that when we evaluate these things, that is it knowing? Are you awake? Okay, that's a fairly low bar. We think that it's voluntary because you're doing things like you think I'm being rational, I'm going and I'm looking at their success rates. Well, what might you want to know about their success rates? Not only how they compare to national averages, but how are they getting that data? Hospitals do things now. It used to be that people died in a hospital. I can guarantee you now that if you're dying, they just call, unless it's in the emergency room and you've been hit, they try and wheel you out of there as fast as they can and get you to a nursing home. They do not want you to die in a hospital anymore because those statistics can be found out by people. And people look at that and think, oh my God, people go there and die. Well, no, they're not going, you know. Doesn't mean that they got great care. The fact that they have, you know, a low mortality rate in the hospital, it's because they're shoving those people out. 
when my best friend who was my boss here at UCO is the legal counsel, when his dad was dying of congestive heart failure, they wanted him out of that hospital just as fast as they could. They put him in the nursing home. That's where they want you to go to die. So are they manipulating those? I mean, I think this is something that if you're really making an intelligent decision, you go to the website and you say, oh, they've got a great success rate. Well, is it because they're only taking the kinds of pancreatic cancer that Peggy has and they're not taking the other kind? And you can manipulate statistics doing that, right? Is it because they're, you know, focusing on the kinds that are, are most treatable? So is that really voluntary or is the will overborn? You look at this commercial and this combination of informational and emotional, and I'm not, it's not clear to me that the will isn't being overborn. People think that they're making a rational decision when they go to CTCA, but I'm not sure that they are. I would suggest to you that if you had cancer, maybe you should look into going to the Mayo Clinic rather than that. The third element is that it's an intelligent choice. So knowing you're awake, you're alive, you're conscious, you, uh, you know, voluntary, somebody's not standing behind you with a gun saying your brains or your signature are going to be on this contract. You think that's a low bar, but when we start thinking about this in terms of are you using hope and fear, fear and hope in such a way as to really manipulate people such that they're not really reacting rationally. And then the third problem, which is really, really difficult, is, is the decision intelligent? And what constitutes an intelligent decision for a rational-based appeal? Well, a totally rational, comprehensive decision would be one that you would do what? <coughs> well, you would gather all of the data. By the time you got all of the data, in the case of Peggy or anybody else who has maybe pancreatic cancer, you may not be around. So it's, it's the fact that you're, you know, knowing, voluntary, and intelligent in those decisions. And I think oftentimes these appeals that combine rational and emotional make us feel, and the thing that we have to think about as marketers from an ethical perspective, is that they make us feel like we're providing customers with choices and we're providing them with information when in fact maybe it's not really a complete picture that we're providing them. And we're using these appeals in such a way as to manipulate, really, um, at least two or three of those prompts of what should be a rational uh, appeal. New technologies such as online and virtual reality are using interaction to immerse consumers so that you have a, a really powerful experience. This is an example of value co-creation. So if we go through those marketing philosophies, you know, the different philosophies, the production era, the sales era, the marketing era, and then the relationship era, virtual reality and the ability that it has in integrated marketing campaigns to really create an experience for the consumer that is really meaningful is, is really one that I think is very interesting. Um, lots of games now are developed that have product placement in them, virtual reality experiences. What's important about that in terms of the product placement and the virtual reality? What do you think? I think that it's a product that's congruent with the experience that you're having. So for example, you know, you might not want a virtual reality game that's based on something like Grand Theft Auto and you know, selling Cadillacs. That would be non real estate. Other types of appeals that you can have, reminder advertising, it's often used with very established brands to remind people of the, the feelings that they had and the joy that they had from doing things. A lot of these you'll find, particularly like at Christmas time, Coca-Cola does the Christmas ads, they did the polar bear ads, those are, you know, the bring back nostalgia for the brand and the good times you had with your family sitting around drinking Coke and eating sugar cookies or whatever. Um, Pure Cane Sugar, uh, as an associated brand, does those kinds of advertising campaigns to remind people, is there a difference? Can you really tell the difference between how can you make sugar? How can you get sugar? What was that? 
No, you don't get sugar from a tree. So you get you get sugar from sugar cane, or you can also get it from sugar beets. And so they have all these advertising campaigns during the holidays, usually with, and they show you mom baking cookies and saying pure cane sugar. Can you really tell the difference between pure cane sugar? There's now all kinds of different sugar substitutes as well. That they're trying to distinguish themselves from. So what else can you use? Artificial, Artificial Splenda. You can use Splenda Stevia. baking, and it actually it actually works pretty well. There's agave, you know, sweeteners, things like that. Um, teaser advertising, mystery ads that build excitement. Now, the, the thing with these is you can't have too much of a delay between the launch of the ad and telling people what teaser ads that, that build excitement around uh, a launch of a product. And then user-generated content. Again, these are um, ads that are being made and engaging in value co-creation with consumers. And companies really are, are able to, to do that. Um, there's a an ad out now, and it's one where it's for people that want to sing the jingle and so that they all submitted their little audition tapes. Um, I'll see if I can find it. I didn't remember to pull that one up today. So execution in the ad. Creative execution is the way the appeal is presented. Informational ads often use the straight sell method. Walmart, rolling back prices, everyday low prices. We all go to Walmart even though we all hate it. I'm like a man going to the gallows. But it's it's necessary. And the straight sell in many of their ads. Now they are trying. Walmart is trying to create more of a uh, feeling of community. Why are they doing that? Because there's been a trend of like small businesses and let's buy local and buy fresh. Yeah. Mimic that. They 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 are, and they've gotten. They were at one point in time obviously accused of destroying the small town downtown. So. You know, with their just straight sell everyday low prices. Um, a variation of the straight sell is the scientific, where you use supporting performance evidence. Crest, the number one chosen brand by dentists. Now, again, when they say these things, or, you know, most preferred by three out of four. Dennis, what do you want to know? If you, if you really have a true informational ad, and they don't do this, why? Because it would take too long. What would you want to know if you wanted to be totally rational about that when they say three out of four dentists? I would three Yeah, how did they get those three out of four dentists? You know, were they, were, were this, the, Samples a random sample? Was it a stratified sample? How did you ask the question? Tylenol, the number one prescribed pain relievers by hospitals. They used to make that claim. Well, what might you want to know? How did Tylenol become the number one most used painkiller in hospitals? They gave it to the hospitals for free so that they could make that claim. And of course, the hospitals, what were the hospitals doing? If you look at your bill, if you've ever been in a hospital, look at the bill. They charge you for all kinds of idiotic stuff. Tylenol, they'll charge you for that, and they were getting it free. After surgery, they'll give you, you might have to see this listed on a bill, a, because you're, if they innovate you, your mouth may be dry and stuff like that, and so you'll start coughing. They'll list on a bill, I saw one client of mine that had this bill that said, cough assistive device. Now that sounds really technical and important, doesn't it? Like after surgery, cough assistive device. So, and I'm thinking like, this is so that, you know, they don't die of asphyxiation or something like that. It turns out the cough assistive device was a pillow that they gave her to hug. 
while she was coughing. Yeah. So it, scientific is a variation, but you, I mean, these are things that we ought to think about. How are you supporting that? What do you want to know? Demonstration. Ads. You see these a lot with car commercials. They demonstrate the product. I love the one, and I can't remember which car it is now, but they talk about it going over all this rough terrain, and they say the only modifications, and if you listen to it, it's a demonstration. They show it going through all of these different terrains, like in the uh, Mojave Desert and up rocks and stuff like that. And I say the Range Rover, and the only modifications are a skid plate, removing the rocker bars, and uh, all-terrain tires. Well, those are pretty significant modifications, aren't they? How much is a set of off-road all-terrain tires? Yeah. Or more? Yeah. I mean, you can spend you can spend two grand yeah. on a set of tires, removing the rocker bars so that it's got independent suspension, and putting on a skid plate. Well, what's that mean? They welded something to the bottom so that you didn't, you know gouge the gas tank or something like that as you're going over it. Comparison, um, advertising, uh, using your competitive advantage. So they, if you think about the Chevy ads, where they have all of the cars, all of the trucks coming out in the desert, you know, and they're like, which one has won the most JD Power performance awards? And they start peeling the cars off until you're left with it. Turns out it's Chevy. Testimonial. So that's what we see in the CTCA ad with Peggy. She's obviously providing a real life example of somebody who's benefited. Slice of life involves problem solving approaches. The head and shoulders commercial. I was looking for the, uh, I was running a little late. I had intended to load these before I had class start, but I had to run and print off stuff. Um, I was looking for the one with the, the dandruff guy who shows up. That's a slice of life. That he's in a white suit. He says, Carl, I didn't know we were having dinner tonight. And she says, who are you? Dandruff. We go everywhere together. And then animation uh, are used a lot. And of course, these can be used to uh, create emotional appeals. If you think back on the um, first appeal commercials that used animation for um, Prozac, this little fuzzy creature that was running around with the cloud over him, and then you know, all of a sudden the sun is shining. They can be enormously powerful as well. Personality, um, we see this, they're bringing back the kernel for KFC using the famous iconic personality. Interesting thing about the kernel, was he really a kernel? He wasn't. He was, uh, he had an honorary, so some states, the governor will issue what are called like honorary colonels. You know, they call you like a colonel aide de camp for the governor. Um, my father actually has several. When he was, uh, when he was the um, special agent in charge of the San Fe office of the FBI, he of course knew a lot of the governors and three or four of them 
uh, made him an honorary colonel aide de camp of the governor. So I guess my father could have said he was a colonel. And that's the kind of colonel that um, Colonel Sanders was. He was a Kentucky colonel. Using imagery where they contain little information and it's almost totally visual in the ad. Dramatization. A lot of ads are short stories that we see, particularly in television and particularly during the Super Bowl. If you think about the Budweiser and the series of ads that they created, we talked about in here um, before, where they had you know the same guy. One year it's training the horse and then sending it off to Budweiser and the horse remembers him and then they add the dog and then the dog gets lost. And those are basically like little vignettes or short movies that are dramatic and create a, a particularly effective book. Yeah, they are. They, they, they make you feel this sort of fondness and affinity towards the Budweiser brand. And at the end, you know, he's sharing a beer with the woman who owns the puppy mill next to it. The use of humor. Now, the use of humor is a lot. Humor is a powerful emotion. But one of the things is, is that it may not be the best to sell um, certain products. It has to be congruent with the product that you're selling. And then, of course, there are the combinations of a lot of these different types of execution strategies where you'll see the use of personality and hope and fear and drama yeah. Create tactics for print, the use of headlines. Headlines are bolder type used to draw attention. Only 20% of readers go beyond the headline. So a lot of ads only contain the headline and then a large visual. They perform a segmentation function for the ad. So they attract the attention of the target audience that you are attempting, or you hope that they attract the attention and segment out. The people that are going to pay attention to the ad are the ones that uh, are in your target audience. So direct headlines are straightforward. Ford, the number one selling pickup in America. You see those in a lot of the print ads that Ford does. You can have indirect, which provokes curiosity. Some ads will contain subheadlines. These are smaller subheads, smaller than the headlines, but larger than the copy. And then finally, the body copy, which is the main text. And there's no one formula that's going to be used you know, for all ads or all products and all companies at all times. But the dilemma with the body copy is that you want to have it long enough to convey a message to your target audience, but short enough to hold their attention. Again, only 20% of readers are going to go beyond the headline. If you think about this back in the olden days before you sat in the doctor's office looking at your phone, and a lot of traditionalists still do this, they sit in the doctor's office and they flip through magazines that are put out, right? And they're just going to flip through it quickly, and only 20% are going to go beyond sort of that headline to read the body copy. Often the visual elements are the dominant element in the ad. Why is that? Yeah, pictures are, are worth a whole lot of words. And how you lay that out, the physical arrangements of the various parts, they need to be blended to create a finished ad, one that's well executed. For TV, The goal is to break through the clutter, to keep people, keep people's attention. One way you could do this is through ad placement, right? There are very few things anymore that people can't simply 
DVR and watch later so that they can skip the commercials. So how do you get them to, to watch it? Well, what are the areas where they are still actually interested in watching it live and not DVRing it? Sports. Sports. Because once the outcome is known, how many people want to watch a baseball game after, after you know who won? The video is usually the dominant feature because television is, by and large, a visual. It's amazing to me how many students say that they actually listen to the television, whereas television is really a visual medium. The audio, uh, the voice, music, and sound effects. So TV, your text tells you, is suited to both rational and emotional, as evidenced by the CTCA Act. It's a combination of the rational and emotional. And this has started with, you know, they start the creative process by developing a script, which is sort of the written version of the commercial that provides the customer of the firm the details of that, of how the video and audio are going to progress and be laid out. Online. Your text tells you, and I, this is one area where I strongly agree with, with the authors, that this has the greatest potential for creativity, and I add, for value co-creation. Because you really can connect with your customer. And online, of course, includes banner ads, search ads, interstitials, native ads, and video. But you're really being able to more and more completely combine these elements to create something that's meaningful to you and to participate with the company. And it's one of those things where they can actually tell what kinds of things you're paying attention to by looking at what click-throughs and metrics that you can monitor and, and get a lot from your, your online content. And so we're seeing a lot more. And the idea as we're going into more and more online and more uh, ability to have stuff now in your handheld device, what can you now do with this? And they can create content that you can look at. During the Olympics, for example, one of the things that NBC did that they advertised heavily that was allowing you to create content and be part of the experience was what? You could take this device and, and do well with it. You could put it into a virtual reality viewer. How many of you did this during the last Olympics? I think it was the first time they did this. But NBC had an app that you could go to. You could download it on your iPhone. You could put this into a virtual reality um, viewer. And then you could actually see, because it was taking panoramic views of various athletes on various things, now, how is that allowing you to create user-generated content? Well, it was doing it in a number of ways. First of all, it was directing you to NBC. You were watching the, I think you had to watch commercials as part of it in order to get the content, or I think you had to pay for it. And then you were able to create the things that you, so if you're most interested in, what are the things that are really visual that would be a great experience for a virtual reality thing in the Winter Olympics, for example? Well, skiing, downhill skiing, the um, the ski jumps, you know, the bobsled, I think that was interesting, the snowboarding um, allowed you, you know, to get a, a bird's eye view. Most of us will never have the skills or the talent to be able to do the kinds of tricks on snowboards and skis that you see in the, the racing, and so those were allowing you to really become a part of and connect with the company and that brand. Fox says on the sports games where you get like club level seats and you can like trick your phone in the VR and it's like you can look at the watch the whole game and you want to capture the Yeah. I mean it's it's incredible what we're able to do now um, with these but how many of you have a virtual reality viewer for your phone? I have the app, I don't have the headset. Yeah. We don't have very many 
there you can buy them really cheaply now. When they first came out, they were pretty expensive. But it's yeah, really, I mean, during the holidays at GD Maps, they're like 30 bucks. It's, price, yeah, it's incredible. Oh, yeah. And that's one of the, actually, that's one of the um, apps is called the Cardboard Viewer. So, how should clients evaluate this? What, is the, what are the guides for evaluating whether or not you're getting good value for your money, a good return on your investment in the integrated marketing program. The creative approach should be consistent with the brand's objectives. So what would be inconsistent if we think back on the Peggy and CTC ad as an example what would be a creative approach that would be completely inconsistent with the CTA if they came up with an ad that was uh, creative but completely inconsistent with the brand's objective? What is CTCA's objective? Their objective is to, very for profit, um, treat people with cancer and make money off of it. They don't want to say that, but they do tell you you can see which insurance companies we take so that you can decide whether or not you should come to CTCA. What would be an appeal that would be incongruent or inconsistent with the, their objectives? Okay, maybe. How about gallows humor? Using humor to sell. I mean, that's probably not going to be a big winner um, with regard to that brand because this is not consistent with. You know, the idea that we're caring and compassionate. Does the ad communicate what it's supposed to? If you think about some really creative ads that we've watched in here, I think the CTC ad, again, I think it does communicate what it's supposed to communicate. It's targeting people with cancer. It does an effective job of telling a story creating interest, using a fear appeal, providing hope for that appeal, um, does it communicate what it's supposed to do? Now, if you think about the Herding Cats commercial, which we watched in here, does it communicate what it's supposed to? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, they sort of at the end, but the nexus is pretty tenuous in my opinion. Between It's creative, it's funny. It didn't but, tell you what to do. Yeah, I mean, it, it didn't make any sense to me. Now, I, I did tell you that I think well, I have a cousin who's a programmer, and he says that that is a commonly used metaphor, particularly with regard to people who engage in cowboy programming, that it's like herding cats. Is it appropriate for the target audience? How could you come up with something that's not appropriate for the target audience? Well, Having somebody who is you know, a fashion model talking about CTCA probably is not going to be appropriate for the target audience. They haven't experienced or they you know, haven't been a, a client of CTCA. Does the ad convey a clear and convincing message to the customer? Now let's think about this with regard to the Budweiser, the three series of ads. I think they're effective. They are like little mini movies, starting with the Budweiser train, you know, the guy training the horse and the horse remembering him, and then the dog, and then the dog gets, you know, put in a, a thing and gets lost and finds his way home. Does that convey a convincing message to the consumer? Where do you see the Budweiser? Well, in the first one, you see it on his cap, you see the Budweiser. When he takes it to the Budweiser brewery for the, the horse to be, and then on the wagon. But in the second one, where the puppy keeps coming in, you don't see the product until when? The end, but of course they've used the ad to begin the first ad, and so there's a maybe a carryover effect from the first, and then in the third, um, it's even less tenuous. Does that execution overwhelm the message? Is the story interfering with the message? What does Budweiser hope to do with those ads? 
They hope to sell beer. That's what they want to do. Okay. Is it overwhelming the message? Mm, yeah, a little bit. It probably could be. Like my girlfriend says, one of those commercials. I think the one with the dog is, is her favorite commercial, but she doesn't drink Bud Light or something. She doesn't drink Bud Light or Bud. I, I think she they're drinks Bud, Bud yeah, Light. Yeah, she just doesn't. It's a she just doesn't drink Bud Light or so. So it's, it's a cute ad, people remember it, but is it going to make you want to go out and you know, drink Bud Light or Budweiser? I think a good one they did was like when Dell Jr. retired and drove the Budweiser car for years. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did his whole life cycle when he started, his dad died, and then fans liked it because it was a red Budweiser car, they were drinking beer at a bar, and they kind of tied it. It was like a mini movie, emotional, exciting, and it sold beer as well, I felt like. I think um, I think those three ads, the series of three ads, I think that they're enormously powerful. They're enormously moving. They create a lot of feeling and emotion. I mean, we all love little puppies, and we all love horses for the most part. I mean, unless you're some communist, uh, you know, most people have affection towards uh, puppies and horses. And studies show this. One of the things that you can do the most, one of the most effective policing tactics that they can use in community policing is to put police officers on mounted patrol. And you know why that is? To get them out of the car and put them on mounted patrol. They, they did this experiment in several cities where they put them either on mounted patrol or bicycles, and they thought both of them would be as effective in getting citizens to engage. The citizens are not at all interested in the bicycle. They have their own bicycle. But they'll talk to somebody on a horse. You know, I mean, little kids will run up. They, they, they stand on they, the fair on horses, and there's a line. Yeah, I mean, the people line up to talk to a cop on a horse. They will not talk to a cop in a car. They will not talk to a police officer on a bicycle. You think that just being out, you know, being on a bicycle is better than being in a car. But, you know, you put a horse there and people will do it. So people love horses. They love puppies. I mean, it's just an all-American sort of, sort of feeling. But I think the new ads about... Bud Light and their lime and their orange and the dilly dilly may actually be, it's, it's humor. Um, and humor doesn't always sell, you know, it, it has to be appropriate to the context, but people, you know, sort of associate drinking with good times until it's not good times and you have to go to whiskey school. Uh, but, you know, I think they may be more effective. You see a lot of the product uh, and I think it's sort of funny and humorous and it may have a better selling message. The Dallas Stars Emily Box says the pit menu is all stuff I buy. Uh -huh. um, is it appropriate for the medium environment in which it's likely to be seen? So, obviously, looking at you know, there's a difference in how you're going to execute. Although you want to have a consistent message throughout your integrated marketing communication campaign, you want to have a consistent message. Uh, across medium, if you're using print, radio, television, all three, or and online, um, but you have to have it appropriate to the media. How should it look? You know, how should um, web pages and things like that look? What's the layout? Is it appropriate um, to that? Uh, to that medium, you have to think about those kinds of things. Is it truthful and tasteful? Is the edge truthful and tasteful? And of course, these things can change uh, as as we evolve in our understanding. The World Health Organization has now come out and said there is no safe amount of alcohol, by the way. So, you know, is it truthful? Is it tasteful? Are the Dilly Dilly commercials tasteful? Yeah, they're kind of funny. They're not making fun of any you know, ethnic group or anything like that. And so I think that, you know, it's, it's tasteful. And that's it for today. And we got through it early. Five minutes. If you feel cheated, you let me know. We'll stay late on Thursday. <laughs>